We don't have anything till four. That's the first one where we actually have work to do on the board. So extra practice problems. Did I get to correcting them yet? No, unfortunately I didn't, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and answer these together. And for time, just because it's short, I'm gonna go through and give you the answers. Once you take a moment to think with your answer, and then you know, we'll deal with whether or not you had the right answer or not. If there's any discussion, I may give a brief reason why, but ultimately, question one asks about physical and chemical changes. So what is the basic question you're asking yourself to determine whether something is a chemical change or a physical change? Just, there's no definition here, just tell me, what, what kind of things are you looking for? Okay, so if, I wouldn't say the atoms change because the atoms don't change, but the structures that, the, that are made up by the atoms, do they change, right? Do the molecules change? Do they get, do the atoms, do the atoms that make up molecules get broken apart and rebuilt as something different? Okay. So if you have something different at the end than you had at the beginning, then it's changed what it is, it's a chemical change. If it just looks different, but it's made up of the same structures as before. If so if the appearance has changed, it's physical change. If it's turned into something different, made up of the same atoms, then it's a chemical change. So a precious vase is smashed to bits. That is a physical change. It's still made up of the same compounds it was before. It's just now in pieces rather than one big piece. Eggs, flour, milk, vanilla, baked, they make a cake. We talked about this one yesterday, right? It's a chemical change. Dry ice turns into gas. It's a physical change. Remember that Phase changes are always physical changes. You're not, having, you're, you're not reacting it with anything. It's going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or vice versa, or in sublimation from a solid all the way to a gas. But you're, using, you're, you're dealing with the same molecules. It hasn't turned into something different, therefore it's a physical change. Charcoal is burned on a grill. It is chemical. You start with coal basically, or carbon. That's the primary thing in, in charcoal, but you have fuel and you have flame and you have oxygen that combine to create carbon dioxide and water vapor. So you're taking something and turning it into something else. It's not simply breaking apart and turning into the white ash. That white ash is made up of something. It's, it's chemically different than the charcoal. Okay, it's the residue, it's the leftover after the reaction. And the Kool-Aid. That's what we did yesterday. Why didn't anybody tell me these sounded very familiar? Because I'm sitting there going, these are stinking familiar. Because I had the wrong sheet out and nobody caught me. So let's start all over again with the practice problems, shall we? Oh, OK, extra practice problems. If a liquid, here we go. If you're, not re if you're not reading along in the book, hope you are. But if you're not, listen up. If a liquid goes through a phase change, and all you know is that the molecules sped up and moved farther apart, Okay, so if it's sped up and moved farther apart, which direction of phase change are we moving? Okay, so, right, we're moving in the solid to liquid to gaseous, right? It's not, you're not told there's any exceptions here, right? So it's a liquid that goes through a phase change and all you know that the molecules sped up and moved farther apart and that what phase did the liquid turn into? So a liquid has molecules that speed up and move farther apart. So what must it have changed into? The gas, right. They're farther apart than liquid, so it has to be now in a gaseous form. Number two, describe what the inside of a container looks like if all three phases of acetone, the fingernail polish remover, were present at the same time. We joked the other day about, ladies, you probably see that quite often, all three phases at the same time. Or don't see it, but you're aware of it. Because you open the bottle and you smell it. It's like, whoa, okay, there's the acetone smell. And there's the crust on the top of the bottle. And inside is the liquid that you're using to remove your nail polish. But let's suppose we had a container that had all three phases together. In other words, somebody left the lid off and some of the acetone inside started to form into a solid and some of the acetone inside stayed as a gas and some of the acetone stayed as a liquid. How would it lay out? How would all three phases look? What would it look like in the bottle? Any, any ideas?
Right, we, we would go back to, think of the analogy of the maple syrup, water, and canola oil. Why did they lay out the way they did? Because they had different densities, right? The most dense was on the bottom, the middle dense was in the middle, and the least dense was on the top. Here you've got the same molecules in a solid, liquid, and gaseous form. Which one is the most dense? The solid sinks to the bottom. Middle density, the liquid stays in the middle. Least dense, the gas. That's why when you open up the bottle, you don't get sprayed with acetone, you smell it, right? Because the gas escapes, the gas comes out, it's the stuff on top, and it's gonna come out of the container. You're technically not smelling the liquid, you're smelling the gas. That's the, sec the other phase that's present in the, in the container. So if you had all three together, you'd have gaseous acetone sitting on top of liquid acetone, and at the bottom of that liquid, solid acetone. Number three, classify the following as physical or chemical changes. Say, a window is broken, physical change, making cake again with all those ingredients, chemical change. Water is boiling, physical change, it's a phase change. You haven't changed the water into something other than H2O. It's just boiling, it's getting energy and it's changing phase from liquid to gas. And D, a wood log is burned in a fireplace, chemical change. Okay. What you have at the end is not chemically the same as what you started with. The, the, the physical solids. Gas is released. Carbon dioxide is released. Some of the carbon that was solid before is now in the air as part of a gas because it's been used to make carbon dioxide, for example. All right, now we get to some number of computations, extra practice problems. Number one, if the mass of a liquid is given and the volume is given, what's its density? So it's a straight density problem. And density, we compute that using rho equals mass divided by volume, right? Rho is density. Mass, what is our default go-to unit for mass? In terms of density, we want to put it in terms of density, mass. What is the basic metric unit for mass? Grams, right. Hello, Windows feature, I don't want you right now. I don't want you on my YouTube either, but oh well, you made your appearance. Let's snooze you. Okay, so my mass is in grams. And my basic unit for volume is milliliters, which is why the basic unit for mat or for density is grams per milliliter. So I want to get my units, most likely, I'm going to get my units in grams per milliliter. Does that mean any other units, as long as it's a mass unit divided, divided by a volume unit, is wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's just not the standard. You're going to see grams per milliliter most of the time, or grams per cc which is the same thing, or grams per cm cubed, which is the same thing, okay? So they're all the same unit. So our standard equation is rho equals mass divided by the volume, and they're asking us for density in this case, so we don't have to re rearrange the formula at all. We're given a mass of 23.13 grams. It's already in the appropriate units, what we'd expect and a volume in 35.0 milliliters. So we just have to plug those into the formula for rho is equal to 23.13 divided by 35.0 grams per milliliter. 0 0.661 grams per milliliter. Is that the right form? I mean the right number of sig figs? How many sig figs are in 23.13? Four, okay. Sig figs in 35.0? Three. Answer has to be to how many then? Three sig figs. How many are there? Yeah, so this is the right format. S sometimes when I ask you, are you sure? You're right, okay? It's an old teaching parent trick, right? Like this morning when I was in my office, a student comes in and I say, I'm sure you know why you're here, don't you? And they say, yes. I said, well, then tell me. Because maybe they think they're here for something that I'm not aware of yet. So then I got them up for a twofer. See? So if I ask, is this the right format? The answer could be yes. Number five. The density of a metal 
is 2.12 grams per milliliter. Okay, so that's standard unit. What's the volume of a 45 grams of the metal? Standard unit. So we're not going to have to do any unit conversions here. The volume is equal to the mass divided by the density. I've taken the density equals the mass divided, divided by volume and just rearranged the formula <coughs> to solve for volume. Given that the mass is 45 grams and the density is 2.12 grams per milliliter, that's what it comes out to be. Okay, let me ask a question. Is that in the right form? No. I kind of made it obvious because I just kept, you know, I put as many places as I could and still get milliliters in on the screen. Okay, so what should the answer be? Correct. 45 is to two places, 2.12 is to three places. The answer can only be to two places. We look to the answer given, take the two places, that would be here and here, look to the right. If it's five or greater, we take this one up. If it's four or less, we leave it where it is. And that's what we did for volume of 21 milliliters. Number six, what's the mass of 0 0.67 liters of gold when the density is 19.3 grams per milliliter? So in this case, we're looking for the mass. We're given the density and the volume. Again, just rearrange the formula, rho equals m over v, to solve for mass, which is rho v. Given the volume is 0 0.67 liters, I want to put that in the appropriate units, the milliliters. And I'm going there because I'm given density in grams per milliliter, so let's get this in milliliters. So as you look at that, one of the things to remember is you're, when you convert it into something else, you have to have the same number of sig figs as the original, right? I'm not going to change the number of sig figs. How many sig figs are in 0 0.67? Two. Hopefully you see that 670 is also two. The trailing zero is insignificant. It's not significant because it's a trailing zero, but it's not right at the decimal point. Okay, so this answer in both these forms have two significant figures so I could use it. If putting it into milliliters would violate that rule and would give me too many sig figs, then I would have to rewrite it in scientific notation with the appropriate number of sig figs, all right? So if I could only have one, you know, it might be seven times 10 to the third milliliters. But in this case, I can have two, so 670 will work. So there's my volume. Rho was given as 19.3 grams per milliliter. Just plug it into the equation. 12,931 grams. What must my answer then be? Not my units. What, how many sig figs should my answer have? What form should it be in? So 19.3 is three sig figs. 670 is two sig figs. For multiplication and division, I can only have as many as my least, right? Two is the least number of sig figs, so my answer can only have two. So therefore, my answer must be 13,000 milliliters because that has two sig figs. Do you see that? All the trailing zeros there are before the decimal place, so they're, they don't count as significant. They're insignificant. The one and the three are the only two digits that are significant, and there are two of them. The same as 670 has two of them. Because when you've got grams per milliliter here, it's going to be, when you do the math, it's grams per milliliter times milliliter. So you've got milliliter over milliliter times grams. So as, you, as long as you're using grams, grams per milliliter, and milliliters, if you do your rearrangement correctly, your units will work. And if you're concerned that you rearranged it wrong, plug in what the units would be and see if it works. So if you, if you end up with math equals milliliters, you go, that's not right. Okay, my formula must be wrong. Let me rearrange the formula so that the units of my calculation end up being the units I'm looking for. Okay. Number seven, here we go into balancing equations. The rest of them are all balanced equations. Now, I put slides together for these, and in putting the slides together, slides actually make it pretty fun and easy for me to do these problems. But 
again, there's a lots of possibility for the animations to be wrong and things to be to blow up. So I apologize in advance if that happens. The other thing is in order for us to do it in the same way, so I can actually create slides, is I kind of set an order. Like I say, first of all, look for where you have more reactants than products and adjust the products accordingly. I ask you to do that only so my slides work. You can do either way, back and forth. You know, you can adjust one side first and adjust the other side first. You can go either side as long as there's an imbalance and you're trying to balance them. And if the process doesn't work, you just keep going. Just keep doing it. Ultimately, at the very end, though, we haven't had one yet where you've had to look at the coefficients and reduce them. So if you get on this rabbit trail of just adding and adding and adding, at the very end, look at the coefficients and make sure you can't reduce them by some common factor. We haven't run into that yet. The only thing I do ask you to do is always save the compounds. Those, those elements that are in more than one place, save them for the end. That's just a hint that will save you lots of anguish, lots of cycles of adjusting other things. Okay. On these problems, in a few cases, in order to not have too many slides, I've done multiple adjustments at the same time. You do not have to do that. Matter of fact, if you need to do it one at a time to make sure you do it right, please do it right. But if you're at the place now where you can kind of start seeing what needs to be done and seeing how it's going to affect other things, it's perfectly legitimate to do more than one modification at a time, adjusting more than one coefficient. Okay, so we may be doing that on these slides. But for your own work, again, there's no compulsion to do more than one at a time. And if you need to do one at, time, one at a time to get it right, please do it one at a time. <coughs> Number seven, hydrochloric acid and calcium react to produce calcium chloride and hydrogen gas. So I've listed all the elements, and we're going to go through it and do the elemental counts. So for hydrogen, it appears one place, one set of one. Chlorine appears in one place, one set of one. Calcium, one place, one of one. On the product side, hydrogen, one set of two for two. Chlorine appears here only, one set of two for two. And calcium, here only, one set of one for one. Okay. Now, the way I've asked you to do it is to, first of all, look for places where you have leftover reactant that hasn't been used and then beef up the product to use it all up. That's not the case here, is it? Second thing you look for is places where there's an imbalance relative to a reactant where you have insufficient reactant. You're claiming you used more than you actually had, so then you can beef up your reactants. That happens for two places, hydrogen and chlorine, right? In this, in this case, we do actually have like a compounded adjustment because hydrogen and chlorine only appear in this one molecule, and when we adjust one, we adjust them both. So what's my adjustment here? Right, adding a coefficient of two in front of the hydrochloric acid. Making that adjustment, now for these slides what I said was, hey, rather than redoing all the reactants, the only ones I have to actually recalculate are the ones involved in this molecule, because that's the only one I adjusted, right? Since I only adjusted hydrogen and chlorine, I'm only going to recalculate hydrogen and chlorine. It's kind of like the next, if you can do this, that's fine. If it causes you problems, just redo everything. Looking at hydrogen again, now from left to right. Two sets of one and no more, which is two. Chlorine, two sets of one and no more, which is two. We're balanced. So the only thing we needed to do to balance this equation was to add a two before the hydrochloric acid. Any questions? Pretty straightforward, hopefully. Number eight. We have bromic acid and sodium create sodium bromide and hydrogen gas. So let's go, what's the count for hydrogen on the reactant side? Just one, bromine, one of one, and sodium, one of one. Product side, sodium, or excuse me, hydrogen, one set of two, bromine, one of one, and sodium, one of one. Now, like on the last one, on this one, this would be kind of like a word problem that says to you, this and this react to produce this and this. You've got to write it down to at least start balancing it. You can't assume it's balanced. But this would be like saying hydrogen and oxygen react to produce water. You've got to start somewhere. Well, hydrogen H2 plus oxygen O2 produces H2O. Okay. There's no assumption it's balanced. That's a true 
reaction equation in the sense of these are the reactants I'm going to use and this is the product I'm going to make. Then we got to jump into it and say, okay, but it's not fully accurate. We need to add coefficients if necessary to balance it. Okay. So in this case, again, looking for reactants that are unused, we have none. Looking for products that are basically overcreated. Where do we have more product than reactant because we have to beef up the reactants? And that happens in only one place, and that's with hydrogen. So our response is going to be put a two in front of the hydrogen bromide over here, right? The bromic acid. Now we have two, and we've adjusted everything in that molecule, which is hydrogen and bromine. We've adjusted it for the reactants. So now we need to go back and recalculate for those two elements. Sodium, I'm not going to, again, this is like next level of, of proficiency. I'm not going to recalculate sodium because I haven't messed with sodium because it only appears over here and I haven't changed the coefficient. But I have changed this, so I've got to recount my hydrogen and my bromine. And now for both of those, the count is two. Two sets of one for each of them. Ask the same question for process I did before. First, where do I have more reactant that hasn't been used up? Bromine, right? I just added the two. I was balanced at one and one, but when I adjusted to balance the hydrogen, I threw bromine into an imbalance. So now I look over to the right-hand side, the product side. In order to use up two, what must I do on the product side of the equation? Put a two where? In front of the sodium bromide, right. Now, that'll give me two because it only, bromine only appears in this molecule, but it affects sodium and bromine counts. So I have to clear those and recount them. Now my bromine count is two, and my sodium count is two. I still have the question. Where do I have excess reactant? Nowhere. Where do I have surplus product? <coughs> sodium. But we're happy because we noticed that sodium is over here in its elemental form, so it's not going to mess anything else up. So all I need to do is balance that, which means adding the two in front of sodium, and there you go. Balanced reaction equation. <coughs> okay. You guys talk me through a little bit more on number nine. We've got silver chloride and zinc react to produce zinc chloride and silver solid. So this is kind of cool because you have silver that's in water. So you got silver water. You know you drink salt water? This isn't salt water, this is silver water. You're going, man, I wish that I could get the silver out of this liquid and melt it into a bar and take it down to the bank and trade it in for, 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 for money. I'd say, I'd say trade it in for cash. You'd probably say turn it in for Bitcoin, okay, or whatever it is you guys are using now, okay? So here's silver, chlorine, and zinc. I wish I could turn my silver water into real silver. And when I was your age, this is what I was involved with over at Eastman Kodak. I grew up in Rochester and I was an explorer post and I went and worked in the chemistry lab there and we were, they have a huge process because you know with film, it's actually silver on the, on the negative that creates the picture. And when you take a picture, what you do is you fix the silver. That's why film photography used to be so expensive before digital. You fix the silver and so some of that silver is not recoverable. But when you develop the film, everything that's not used gets washed down the drain. But they don't send it straight down the drain, they send it to this recovery place where all of the silver water comes in and by the time it gets to the end of the tank, all the silver is collecting into solids so they can skim it off and either convert it into cash or reuse it into the chemical to make new film. So they're recovering all the silver because the alternative is to just let it go down the drain and go out into Lake Ontario and you get all these silverfish. Not really, but you know. So. Balancing this equation because you want to keep the silver and let everything else go. And chlorine and zinc are relatively cheap compared to the silver. So if I do this reaction, I can flush cheap stuff down the drain and keep the expensive stuff. So these are the three elements involved. Let's go through and do the counts. Again, this is a general statement that says, if you take silver chloride and zinc and react it, you will get zinc chloride and silver. Reactants. One set of one, chlorine, one set of one, zinc, one set of one. Products, silver, one set of one, chlorine, one set of two, zinc, one set of one. What do I need to do? What's my next step? Okay, 
we're increasing the amount of chlorine available to us, right? We need more chlorine in the reaction, in the reactant side. We do that, chlorine only appears here, so we need to bump this up to match. We need two, so let's give us two by putting the two in front. That's gonna change my silver and chlorine count on my reactants, so we recount them. Two silver, two chlorine. Are we balanced? Okay, next adjustment. Molly. Put a two in front of the silver because we said, let me go back real quick. We said we had two, but we didn't use them all up. We need to use them all up. And Molly got excited because she realized that the silver is in its elemental form and I can adjust that. It doesn't mess with anything else. Because boom, when we put the two in front of there, the only thing we have to recount is the silver and it's two. And now we're going, okay, are we balanced? No, we're not balanced. But we need more what? We need more zinc in the reactant side, right? And lucky for us, zinc is in the reactant side as a elemental form. So we just can throw a, what we need, we need two, so let's make it a two. Oops, I need one more slide. We would make it a two, and when we made it a two, the only thing that would change, if this were made into a two, would this would become a two, and when that becomes a two, then it's balanced. Hopefully you're getting the point where as we get more and more things, we're just doing the same process over and over again. And I've encouraged you before, don't be intimidated by the molecules or how many of them are in the reaction. Just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Somebody wanna like tap them? If I wanna have to throw an eraser. Please rejoin us. Please rejoin us. Okay. General reaction, magnesium chloride and sulfuric acid combined to produce magnesium sulfide and hydrochloric acid. Does anybody have any concern about the process? Do you understand the process? Let's just see if we agree then. So we do the counts. Magnesium is one, chlorine is two, hydrogen is two. It's here, one set of two, and sulfur, it's here as one set of one. On the product side, magnesium is at one at one, chlorine is one at one, hydrogen is one at one, and sulfur is one at one. What's my adjustment? Using the process I've given you. And I've kind of, I've, it's a fake process in the sense that I've said, first, use up all your reactants. That just makes my slides tend to work better. So if we do that, where's my adjustment? I need to use up more of what, ma'am? Need to use them up. And guess what? They're linked to each other as a product, right? In hydrochloric acid. So if I fix one, I fix both. In this case, I need to increase my coefficient to two. When I increase the coefficient to two in the product, I now need to recount my hydrogen and my chlorine. They only appear there, so they become two and two. That's it. We're done. Number 11. Carbon dioxide and water. Reacts to produce this monster Cho molecule and oxygen. So we do the counts. One carbon. Oxygen is here as one set of two and one set of one, which is three. And hydrogen is one set of two, which is two. On the product side, carbon, 18. Somebody said, oh, something, like an expression. This is going to be tough. Okay, here's what you do. You repeat the numbers underneath them. Okay? So carbon, <laughs> carbon is 18 because it says 18. Oxygen is 16 plus 2, which is 18. And hydrogen is 32. How do I know that? Because it says 32, okay? <laughs> so whoever went, oh man, there. I know it's hard to copy numbers down, but there we go. Okay, so it's one, three, and two, produces 18, 18, and 32. We need a lot of help on the reactant side, right? Every one of them is unbalanced. We have too few reactants, but where could we make our adjustments? So I'm gonna wait and do oxygen last because oxygen appears in two places. But where else can I make adjustments? I need to make an adjustment to carbon, right? How many do I have to have on the reactant side? How many do I have to have to start with? 18. I said I used 18. I better have 18. How am I going to get 18? Put an 18 where? In front of the carbon dioxide, okay? But before I go anywhere, I also happen to notice that I need more hydrogen. 
And hydrogen only appears on this side, or on this side only appears in this molecule, so I can do a double adjustment, right? So I need to have 32. I have two, so how do I have 32 hydrogens? They come in sets of two, so to have 32, I need 16, right? 16 and 16 are 32. Let's go. Two and two are four. Four and four are eight. Eight and eight is 16. 16 and 16 are 32. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and adjust that. Let's do the 18 and 16. With the 18 and 16, it messes up our carbons and our oxygen. It messes up everything, so we're just going to have to do the whole count again. And the carbon happens to be 18. And the oxygen happens to be 18 times 2, which is 36, plus 16, which is 52, and hydrogen is at 32. OK, so where do we need more stuff? Balanced, balanced, unbalanced, unbalanced in the we need more product. We need more oxygen in the product. And we are so overjoyed because we notice on the product side that we need more oxygen, and oxygen is in the elemental form. Mm -hmm. And so we can just simply slap a coefficient on the front of that. And how much do we need? What does the coefficient need to be? Think, be careful. Be careful, because no matter what you do over here, you still have 16 there. So don't get too many. So if we need 52 and we can already have 16, how many more do we need? Okay. If we need 52 and we already have 16, how many more do we need? It's that third grade math again. Come back to haunt you. 52 minus 16. You think of it as 52 minus 10, it'd be 42, minus 6 more. It's 36. Good answer. 36 more. How do we get 36 more if we have sets of two? 18 and 18 are 32. Okay, good. <laughs> Boom. We throw an 18. It's 36. I said 32. Yeah, 16 and 16 are 32. But if we do that, we have 18 over here. We have 18 times... Oh, well, this is the same, 52 over here. We have 16 from here and 18 times 2, which is 36, which gives us 52, and our reaction is balanced. Okay.